Anyway, my name is Chris Howard. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I want to talk about something I call the five B's. And I thought uh, Jeff Rosen did a great job of saying his challenge was the most important challenge. I'm not issuing a challenge per se, but what I'm talking about undergirds every challenge you're going to get into. It's called the five B's. And if you live these five B's, if you take them to heart, if you understand them, then you will win. You'll win the game of life. You'll be the warrior that the mayor talked about. It'll help you be a better person. Do you believe me? She's like, I don't believe you. I got to hear this. So anyway, here we go. It's very simple, very straightforward. And I think it will help you as you go through this competition and as you go through your lives. The first B is this. Be yourself. Be yourself. Chris Howard, seventh grade, about <clears throat> years ago, back in Plano, Texas, just north of Dallas. And by the way, you guys had the Broncos, we had the Cowboys. Ouch! But anyway, it's another story. But you gave us Cal Orton. That's another story. Um, seventh grade, Haggard Middle School, uh, public school, great, great little school. And uh, Howie, they should call me Howie back then, back when I had an afro back in the day, shows up to school with the tie on. Now, get to, get, here's the optic. It's a public school where you don't have to wear a uniform. Guys don't put on no ties. They barely want to put on underwear, right? It's this, it's, it, you know what? There's no dress code. So I show up there with a tie on. And my friends are like, hey, Howie, why are you wearing a tie to school? And I'm like, I want to be somebody significant. I want to be somebody important. I want to be a leader. I want to carry myself a certain way. And they said, OK, Howie's on crack. <laughs> but it didn't matter, because I was going to be myself. Fast forward ninth grade, I decided that I was going to join Army JROTC. Anybody have JROTC at your schools? Great program, military training program. I joined the Army JROTC program, helped make me the man I am today. But here's the challenge. When you are in this military program in a public school, you wear your uniform once a week. Uh, and I'm an Air Force Academy graduate, so our uniforms are much handsomer now. But back then, I had to wear a BUU. Y'all know what a BUU is? A butt ugly uniform. <laughs> so here's the optic. Once at four days a week, I'm sporting a tie. Nobody else is. The fifth day, I'm wearing a green uniform with nothing on it. I was a real ladies' man. <laughs> no, I wasn't. But anyway, I was going to be myself because I felt like Mr. Rosen was saying I wanted to serve my country, defend that Constitution, so I was in JROTC. Fast forward to my senior year. I'm playing football on the state championship football team. I'm in Army JROTC. Now check this out. I'd risen from being a cadet private with nothing on my uniform, nothing to it, to being a cadet colonel, Cadet Colonel Howard. Man, I had ribbons up to here. I had medals down to there. And check this out. They even gave me a knife to go to school with. They gave me a saber, right? So I'd be in the locker room with my teammates. And they say, hey, Howie, man, you look pretty cool. I'm like, back off. <laughs> yeah, just make fun of me. No, I'm like Zorro the gay blade. Now I got this knife and I mean, this big saber to wear to school. That same person who was that student body president, Mayor, Mayor Hancock, when they only got it was student body president. I was student body president too. <laughs> student body president, head of the Army JROTC program, captain of our state championship football team. Texas, where we play some really good, we can't play much pro football, but we can play some high school football though. <laughs> Played against the Odessa Permian, the Friday Night Lights stuff, beat them three times history of our school, which was great. All the guys were like, Friday Night Lights, that's cool, that's cool. The movie, not the TV show, the movie. <laughs> anyway, after we have our games on Friday nights, right? And on Friday night after the game, you know what's up? You know what's up? It's party time. So you show up at a party. Sometimes the parents are there. Sometimes the parents aren't there. I'm old, but I'm not that old. You show up at the party, people are like, hey, Howie, what's up, man? They're like, hey, what's up? They're like, hey, Howie, you want to drink this? I'm like, no, no, thank you. Hey, Howie, you want to smoke this? I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to smoke this. Uh -uh. Hey, Howie, you want to touch this? No, 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 no. <laughs> Because I was going to be myself, right? I was going to be myself. So that same kid from seventh grade to ninth grade to twelfth grade I just described to you was what made me who I am today, that willingness to be myself. And I want you all to recognize this, by the way, because you're going to go back into your schools. You're going to go on to other great colleges and universities, Hampton Sydney College, Hampton Sydney College, Hampton, Denver, you know, Harvard, Princeton, Hampton Sydney. You're going to go to all these great schools. And no matter where you go to school, no matter where you go to school, and like, Cornell, what, it doesn't matter. People are going to ask you to smoke, drink, or touch things you're not supposed to be smoking, nor drinking, nor touching. 
And when they ask you to do that, you think back to that good looking brother on the stage, that bald headed black dude that said, you can be yourself. You can be yourself. So that's my first B. That's my first B. My second B is going to require a volunteer. And there's a real cool dude from South High School that I met earlier. Come on up now, man. Come on. Man. Come on up, man. Don't be slow. I, I, I chose you out of everybody. You walking like my last. Come on now. My clock's ticking. Time's money. Mine's on my money and my money's on my money. Sorry. Remind me of your name? Jeffrey. Good to see you. You got to give a round of applause to Jeffrey. Look a little bit like Miguel, the singer Miguel, the sharp. <laughs> anyway, Jeffrey, my second B goes back to the great philosopher Bill Cosby, right? And Bill Cosby says, you know, Jeffrey, I, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out <laughs> and make another one just like you. Mm -hmm. So the second B is to be humble. Be humble. Go ahead. You can have a seat now. Thank, Thank you, me. Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Give Jeffrey a round of applause real quick. Thank you very much. <laughs> be humble. Be humble. I have two sons. In fact, when they behave, they're my sons. When they misbehave, they're my wife's sons. One's 16, one's 20, and my little 16-year-old Josh was like, Dad, I just got Madden 2075, whatever the video Xbox game is. I'm going to go play it on Xbox. I'm like, that's not your Xbox. That's my Xbox. I'm just letting you play it. And my 20-year-old son, Cohen, he's like, Dad, I got this great Volvo. It's so tricked out. He's a sophomore in college. It looks so, looks so cool and everything. My like, son, that's not your car. That's my car. I'm just letting you drive it. So I, I said, I just sit the boys and I said, check this out, Cohen and Joshua. Understand this. You two, me and your mama, we're rich. You two, you're poor. <laughs> so be humble. Don't take credit for things that you have not done. Don't take credit for what your mama did, your daddy did, your grandpa did, your meemaw did, your doctor did, your dog catcher did, but know that you can do it. It is in you. It is in you. And you wouldn't be a part, as Mary Hancock said, of this subset of this subset of this subset of this subset to be invited to be a part of this challenge if it was not in you, right? So we know you're going to get there, but you're not quite there yet. There's a great Kenyan proverb that goes like this. No matter how tall you are, no, no, sorry, no, how, no matter how tall your grandfather is, you still have to grow. No matter how tall your grandfather is, you still have to grow. So be humble. My third B goes back to my time at the United States Air Force Academy. And by the way, my college roommate is here, Art Romero. We've known each other since 1922 when we were at the Air Force Academy together. I love him like a brother, but we almost beat the hell out of each other when we were in school together. Art, right, stand up and get a round of applause. That's my, that's my main man. Thank you for coming out. The reason I mentioned the Air Force Academy, as I mentioned before, I played football at the United States Air Force Academy. In fact, he won an award a year ago called the Campbell Award. And a few years, for the top scholar athlete in college football, several years later, a guy named Peyton Manning won that same award. So I'm better than Peyton Manning. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying, good luck to Peyton this weekend. No, but uh, I had a coach there named Fisher DeBerry who's in the College Football Hall of Fame. Fisher DeBerry was from the great state of South Carolina. Anybody from state, South Carolina? Y'all don't want to admit it? Don't want to complain? Okay, anyway, once I tell this story, you won't want to admit it. So Coach DeBerry was from South Carolina, which meant he spoke often, loud, and in a way that you could not understand. He would say things like this. Oh, y'all remember when you came to kid to put the punk over right place for you right now? What the hell did Coach DeBerry just say? I don't know, but keep running. He might just be quiet. But Coach DeBerry had a way with, way with words. He just would, use, he would say things like, ah! Let me Google that. Ah, what is that? And he had these wonderful sayings. He'd say things like, ladies and gentlemen, when you leave this place today, when you leave this place today and you see a turtle on a fence post, he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> Coach, we're playing football. This is not violent. What turtle? What are you talking about? Anyway, but the man, he was beloved. He's a Hall of Fame coach. He's like a, another, another father to me. But Coach DeBerry used to do something that you see in athletic competitions all the time, athletic practices. He'd bring us up after practice, put us in a little horseshoe around him. And this was going back to um, my second, uh, the, the fourth practice of my senior year during tour days. And he'd have us in a semicircle. 
He was talking to us about some stuff, and he'd have us down on one knee. This is the commonality, and I'll bring it up to that specific event. But, but Coach would have us in that semicircle, and we'd be down on one knee, and Coach DeBerry would be going on. So you're down on, just, just to give you all the optics, so you're down on the one knee like this, and you look up Coach DeBerry, and he's going on. By God, we haven't beaten Army in a while. We've got to beat him right now. We've got to do this right now. And he just, he's just going on. He's on a roll. He's on a roll. So it keeps going on so long, you got to switch knees. <laughs> Woo, Coach is into it, man. And I got, we got to do that. We got to, and you just switch knees again. Well, on that fourth practice my senior year in two days, it was 17 knees later, <laughs> the coach to Barry said something that I'll, never change, that I'll never forget, excuse me. He said, by golly, men, what kind of team we have if everybody would have practiced just like you? And by golly, men, what kind of team we have if everybody would have played just like you? And by golly, men, what kind of team would we have if everybody were to comport themselves in the classroom just like this beautiful young lady right here? We didn't have a lot of beautiful young ladies on the team, so go with me on that. But, <laughs> but anyway, you, you know where I'm going with this one. What kind of team we have? What he was asking us to do, and it hit me right between the eyes, he was asking us to be accountable. There would be. Be accountable, right? And when he said that, I thought back to my junior year at the Air Force Academy taking a moral philosophy class where we studied a, a German philosopher named Immanuel Kant who had this thing called the categorical imperative. And, and what Immanuel Kant said, he said was, how universalizable are your actions? If everybody were to act like you in every moral or any moral circumstance, what kind of world would we have? Think about the synthesis of those two ideas. Coach asked me, what kind of team would we have? If you took a lazy step and everybody did that, what kind of team we have? Emmanuel Kant asking that larger philosophical question of what kind of world would we have? Now, a lot of guys in here, especially basketball fans, they may like, I'm a, I know I'm in Denver, but I spent four years at the University of Oklahoma as a professor and a vice president, so I'm a Thunder fan, right? Nobody hit me, okay, good. So I'm an Oklahoma City Thunder fan. And so I get the privilege of going to a basketball game every year, one of my friends is a owner of the team, we sit there on the floor, we, we watch a game about five years straight, and it always comes down to the wire. Me and my family are truly blessed to be able to watch the Thunder play, and it'll be three seconds left on the, in the clock, and Coach uh, Brooks will have the team on the, to the side, and they'll say, here's the options. And guys, speak to me, and the young ladies might know as well, but the guys going to know, what's the number one option for Oklahoma City Thunder? Who is it? Kevin Durant. Who's the second option? Trick question, it's Durant, 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 Durant. Y'all, no one ever gets that right. No, option one, two, and three of Kevin Durant. What I'm asking you all to be, what undergirds this whole challenge and what we're doing here, is I want you to want the rock. I want you to want to be accountable. It's not enough to be accountable, but I want you to be like, hey, coach, give me the rock. I want to be the one that leads in this circumstance. I want you to be accountable. And understand this, accountability becomes greater over time. So how many seniors I have in here? Where are my seniors? All right, good for you. Juniors? <laughs> loud, loud. Juniors are louder than seniors. Too. Sophomores? I know there's at least one sophomore. There we go. Any freshmen? All right. So freshmen, freshmen, freshmen. Love you, freshmen. When you came to school, when you came to school, the seniors are like, I hope he or she can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. You all were able to open up your lockers, they're like, oh, Hercule, Hercule, they're so good, they're so good. Because <laughs> you're freshmen and expectations aren't extraordinarily high for you from the get-go. But when you become a sophomore and as you become a junior and senior, eyes, they start watching you, they stay watching you. And I promise you, where my senior, why don't my senior stand up real quick? You have a special mantle of leadership and accountability. They're only going to be teams, so don't get an attitude with them and be like, Dr. Howard said, I'm a senior, you got to do what I can tell you. Now, don't get an attitude about it. But I want you to understand, you have a special mantle because there's a freshman at your school. I promise you, all of you all are 9th through 12th grade, you all have freshmen there? Okay. There is a freshman at your school looking at you and saying, I want to be just like you. And there's a freshman at school looking at that young lady right there and saying, I want to be just like you. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. And so what that means is that mantle of leadership, when you don't think that freshman is looking at you, 
Well, you don't think anybody's looking at you? I'm going to tell you something. And all the old folk in the house, if you're over 25, you're old. All the old folks know. <laughs> when you don't think that they're looking, what are they doing? They're looking. They're looking at you. And every time you say a bad word, and every time you act foolishly toward a teacher, and every time you mistreat another student, you're giving them license to do the same thing. You are, as the United States Army says, you're setting a standard. And now all of you all as leaders are setting the standard, but especially my seniors, you all are setting the standard. And it doesn't change. You don't think when Mayor Hancock's doing something, people are like, there go the mayor. Mm-hmm, there you go. Oh, look what he just did. Oh, uh -huh, let me tweet that. <laughs> so I, my own personal story, I'm uh, Hampton City College is just south of Richmond, Virginia. There's a, a place uh, called... Uh, uh, Wintergreen is a wonderful ski resort not too far away. One of my trustees has a house there. I went and visited him. I drive there, bring my dog with me. I'm, I'm solo that day. My wife and kids were, were gone. I bring my dog. I drive a couple hours away. I go to the place. I arrive at this beautiful little house that my friend has. I start getting out of my car. And all of a sudden, somebody goes, Dr. Howard. I go, God? <laughs> and it wasn't God, actually, but rather it was one of the employees of my school a woman who works in our business office who has a, a house across the street from where this trustee lived, the person who, who, one of the board of trustees from Hampton, Sydney. First off, I thought, man, she's making some pretty good money to have a house out here in Wintergreen, but that, was the, that wasn't the point. <laughs> the point was to be talked for a few minutes. What are you doing here? Are you here to see Dr. Hillen? This is great. We talked for a few minutes. I went to the house, took my dog, took my, my stuff, and went inside. Now, you can imagine how differently that could have gone. I could have gotten out of my car, could have scratched my butt, picked my nose, kicked my dog. <laughs> it's like a country and western song, doesn't it? <laughs> I scratched my butt and picked my nose and kicked the dog. No, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but the point is, I got to be accountable. Not perfect, but accountable. And you don't know who's watching, and when you don't think they're watching, they're watching. So be accountable. Be accountable. My fourth B goes back to a place that one of your future speakers and I are going to have in common is Del Rio, Texas, Laughlin Air Force Base. January 17th, 1995. At that point, I was Captain Chris Howard, United States Air Force, in flight school. And I was on my third solo mission flying a T-37 jet trainer, this little bubble jet uh, uh, aircraft, instructor pilot, uh, student pilot sits here, instructor sits here, has kind of a bowed canopy, a little, little, little jet, can pull about seven, seven Gs, really, really great little aircraft that the Air Force has been using for a trainer for many, many decades. And this is in Del Rio, Texas, on the Texas-Mexican border, uh, down uh, sort of southwest of uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I'm flying, and I'm out in my third solo, and I'm up in the air, and I make a radio call that sounds something like this. This is Tiger 7-1, Area 3, now question, Mission Acrobatic Movies, over. Roger 3-7, you're clear about the news, roger that. Man, I was cooler than the other side of the pillow, baby. Because <laughs> I'd been given permission to do an acrobatic maneuver called the Cuban 8. Do you all want to see the Cuban 8? Yeah. <laughs> In Denver, I thought, I mean, LA, they're like, yeah, woohoo! In Denver, I thought y'all all quiet. Y'all want to see it? You sure? Okay, here we go, here we go. So it looks like this. You want to see it again? <laughs> so here you are on the jet. You go from I'm upside down. I'm inverted. You go from inverted to erect. And you go to pull a stick up to do the other part. But here's the deal. This is what happened on January 17, 1995. Uh, I went to pull the stick this way. Instead of the airplane going this way, it went that way. <laughs> now, you don't have to be an AP student at East High School in physics to know when you pull the stick this way, the airplane ain't supposed to go that way. <laughs> so when I started this maneuver, I was going about 250 miles an hour roughly. Now, and when I'm pulling the stick up, all of a sudden, the airspeed starts to increase. So I'm going 260 miles an hour, 270, 280 miles an hour. And the airplane is starting to make sounds, ladies and gentlemen, that airplanes should never make. Airplanes that usually sound like this, rear, 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 sound like this, rear, rear, rear. That is a bad aircraft sound. <laughs> so 
as I'm approaching 280, 290 miles an hour, and the airplane's going into this sort of Bugs Bunny death spiral dive, I start doing some really, really bad algebra in my head. If Captain Hour is flying at the ground 300 miles an hour, <laughs> and a train leaves Denver at 2 o'clock in the morning, when's Captain Howard going to die? <laughs> These word problems always have a train. I don't know how it works. I'm not very good at it. But that's some really, really bad algebra. I'm getting really negative in the seat. The airplane's making those sounds. I'm starting to hit my head on the top of the canopy. You go to those amusement parks. You're riding a roller coaster. And you go down. You get really negative. Those of y'all that have hair, I hate you. Now, those of y'all that have hair, your hair starts kind of shooting up in the air and stuff like that. So that's what's happening to me to give you the sensation of going 310 miles an hour at the ground, heads hitting the top of the canopy. You're trying to, you're no longer cool than the other side of the pillow. I promise you that. You're trying to negotiate the aircraft and figure out what's going on. Then all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, I start to see things that pilots should never see. I start to see trees. I start to see leaves on trees. I start to see squirrels on leaves on trees. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I start to see nuts in the hands of squirrels on leaves on trees, and I say all of a sudden, I'm going to die. And that's not funny. Oh, there's an injection seat on this thing. So I reach down, grab the hand grip, squeeze the trigger. <laughs> what that is, is the explosion at the bottom of the seat, intentional, that blows me straight up, blows the canopy off, I'm about 320 miles an hour, and when that canopy comes off, it's like getting hit in the face by an all-American free safety on a Saturday afternoon, right? That's the... <laughs> so all of a sudden, after that opening shock, my canopy deploys, and all of a sudden, woo! <gasps> <gasps> Again, no longer cooler than the other side of the pillow, I promise you that. And I kind of come to my senses, and I realize that I'm under my canopy, and I'm hanging under a parachute, right? And I've gone through some training, and I know what I'm supposed to do now. I'm supposed to take my cool Tom Cruise visor thing, and I'm supposed to raise the, my helmet, raise the visor, but I touch my face, and the helmet's been sucked off in the ejection. And then I look down at my hands, and I realize that my Nomex fight with hardened gloves have been sucked off in the ejection. And then I touch the side of my face, and I realize that it's swollen and blood's coming down the side of my face. And because I was doing a high-speed, low-altitude ejection, I didn't have a lot of what you call swings in the chute. I swung a couple times. I looked over from right to left. About 800 meters away, I saw the aircraft hit the ground, <laughs> explode. It was like a movie. A horror movie, but a movie. Very surreal. So I swung in the, a couple more times in my canopy, and I said, you know what, I'm going to land right there. And so I landed right there. And I had about 50 parachute jumps as an Air Force uh, cadet, uh, officer and what have you. So I'd, I'd done parachute jumps intentionally in the past. And when you land in a parachute, you're supposed to do what you call a PLF, a parachute landing fall. I did a PFL, pretty freaking bad landing. <laughs> so I pummeled in the ground. I sat there for a second, said lots of words you shouldn't say in mixed company nor on a recorded thing that you can't repeat in front of your mama. And I drank some water. I realized my knee was quite swollen. I took my parachute and I arranged it, put some rocks around it because I knew that the uh, rescue folks would be coming in. Set my emergency locator transmitter up and I just sort of waited. Well, a few hours later, the Border Patrol helicopter came in, right on the Texas-Mexican border, came in and because it had been signaled in by another aircraft. One of my fellow students had seen where I went down and it, and it landed and they put me in the helicopter and I flew back to Laughlin Air Force Base there in Del Rio. I got off the, am the ambulance, after the hel helicopter the ambulance, I made my way to see the commander who was there at the air airfield, Colonel Tim Pepe, great man. I got off the helicopter, I limped toward him, and I said, uh, Sir, Captain Howard reports. He said, what happened? I said, Sir, I was doing a Cuban 8, became a nose low recovery, then I had to eject. Well, he says, young man, you made a great decision because I'm here to shake your hand and not pick it up off the ground. So within two days, I told you I hurt my knee, I was whisked down to Wilford Hall in San Antonio, Texas. It's a big Air Force military uh, hospital where I had knee surgery. And after that two days, I went back up to Laughlin Air Force Base and I went through about seven weeks of knee rehabilitation, but just as importantly, I went through two investigations, not one, but two investigations. 
And after those investigations, after those seven, eight weeks of rehabilitation, the Air Force commanders, the powers that be came to me and said, hey, Captain Howard, this is what you did wrong. This is what the aircraft did wrong. This is what your instructor pilot did wrong. But you are cleared to fly again. And you can imagine that night when I'm sitting in my room, ladies and gentlemen, in Del Rio, Texas, in March 1995, I'm thinking to myself, the last time I flew an airplane, I damn near killed myself. So I'll take a job on the ground. You got anything really low? I can sit down all day and never have to get out of this seat. But I thought about something. I thought about the Buffalo Soldiers, the all-black unit that fought between the end of the Civil War up through World War II, won 16 Congressional Medals of Honor. When they came back to towns like Montgomery or Dallas or Richmond, they were treated like second-class citizens because they were black. I thought about the Tuskegee Airmen. Have you ever saw the movie Red Tails? All-black fighter pursuit group, 332nd fighter pursuit group, led by Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. Graduated from West Point in 1936. No, no black classmates. His classmates did not speak to him for four years, except for official business, because he was black. You guys can't go three minutes without tweeting or Facebooking or texting. He went four years and his classmates did not talk to him. But yet and still, he led this fighter pursuit group that escorted bombers over North Africa and Europe, never lost a bomber. But when he came home with all those medals and all those ribbons, he was treated like a second class citizen because of the color of his skin. I thought finally about Sergeant Charles Bo Howard, my uncle, highly decorated Vietnam veteran, 101st Airborne. He's back. Uncle Bo always had a clean Oldsmobile. Driving his car on the base, early 70s, goes or late 60s, goes on to the, he's heading to the base, gets pulled over by a police officer. Officer says, he gets, gets him out of the car, says, you were speeding. My uncle goes, no, sir, I wasn't speeding. He says, shut up, N. And the N didn't stand for NBA, I promise you. I thought about how my uncle had served honorably in Vietnam, but was treated like a second-class citizen. So when I went to see Colonel Pepe that next day, and I said, I have an opportunity to fly, and I thought about all those opportunities that have been given to me, the standing, as Sir Isaac Newton says, the reason I can see so far is because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I walked into Colonel Pepe, I saluted Smartland and said, Sir Captain Howard reports prepared to fly. Seven months later, I was an Air Force pilot. Here's the final, here's the fourth B. Be courageous. Be courageous. Now, you will hear people bathe you in ideas of how great a leader you're going to be. The, he, the thing we hear more about in social media and the media is either leadership or the Kardashian-Kanye West relationship. Those two things seem to be out there all the time. But on the first accord, leadership, you will hear it all the time. You'll be told you need to be the leader, you gotta do this, do that. If you do not have a modicum of emotional, physical, and moral courage, you will not be leaders. I'm not advocating going out and crashing an airplane to become courageous. That I'm advocating just the opposite. But do understand this. If you want to lead, and you have shown that by being here that you want to lead, you have to understand. You have to be courageous. You've got, and it can be little things. Quick story. A couple years ago, a guy comes up on Facebook, on my, little, on my Facebook page. He's like, hey, Howie, I just want to tell you a story and how, how you, what you mean to me. And I remember the story. We were in, I was in eighth grade, he was in sixth grade, we were in the same math class, not because I was dumb, but because he was really smart. And people kept picking on this kid all the time. Sixth grade or eighth grade math class, he got picked on. At one point, our teacher left the classroom, and I was sitting there, and they were making fun of him. I was like, y'all need to leave Fred alone, man. He's cool, man, y'all need to stop making fun of him, stop bullying him. And he recounts that story, he says, well, my name wasn't Fred, but you were trying, how, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> so being courageous can be big, it can be small, but be courageous, be courageous. And here's my final B. It goes back to the great thinker, the great civil rights activist that inspired Dr. King, and it's Mahatma Gandhi, and that is be the change in the world you want to see. Be the change in the world you want to see. That's that great John Mayer song, Waiting on the World to Change. Man, this is the Aspen Challenge. We ain't waiting on nothing and nobody. The tools are here. The tools are here. So be the change in the world you want to see. 
So here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the challenge, right? You get this right, then you win. You win, you become that warrior, you win in life, and you have a good chance of winning this competition. Be yourself, be humble, be accountable, be courageous, and be the change in the world you want to see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eric said that uh, I have time for two or three questions. Right there. So I believe that in the United States, one of the hardest things to do is be a black man. What are one of the challenges or some of the challenges that you went through while you were becoming the man that you are today? Mm. I'll do two things. One of them is mighty personal. So my mom told me when I was very young, you are a black man in America. And this is not going to be a PC answer, politically. I'm going to say my mama told me, you have to do it better than everyone else. Because the moment you don't do it, people are going to say, oh, I told you so. That's what we expect of them. And so I carried that with me. I didn't see it as a burden. I saw it as an inspiration, kind of like my great-great-grandfather coming from being property to me being the college president. So I always understood that I had to work a little harder, and I was okay with that. I was okay with that. My junior year at the United States Air Force Academy, just down the road, I was dating a woman who happened to be Caucasian. And um, we were very close. We were dating for almost two years. And at one point, her grandfather, who pretty much raised her because her father passed away in a car accident, um, and her mother had as well, said that, uh, you know, I hear you're dating somebody. Tell me about him. And she tells him about me. And, and she had been told that since she was a kid, that if she ever dated a black man, she'd be disowned. And this guy happened to be very wealthy as well. So she talked to her grandfather. She comes to see me. Uh, and she says, this is what's going on. She's in tears. And she says, you know, pretty much I had to, you know, either be disowned or date you. And I said, well, you know what? I will never ask you to do that. I'll be worse than him so we can just break up. Well, fast forward about a week later, she calls me up and she says, I want to I wanna date you. And I'm like, this is great. I really care deeply for this woman. Her name is Demi Pinella was her name. Anyway, uh, Demi and we and I were together on a, on a Sunday, and then on a Monday the next day, I'm with my buddy Art Romero, my roommate. I get a phone call to come to the desk. Um, it's before cell phones were really big, and I answer the phone, and it's her stepfather. And she says that Demi's been in an accident. I said, is she okay? She goes, no, she's dead. She died in a car accident on I-25. And when I went to the funeral, I remember thinking to myself, the last thing I said to her was, I love you. The last thing that he said to her was, I hate you. And what was powerful, though, is when I was a senior, and Art can attest to this, I was kind of Captain America, wasn't I, Art? <laughs> Wherever you are. Yes, thank you very much. So I got in his spot. So I was a top-ranking junior. I was student body president. I was almost a 4-0 student. I was starting on the football team. I was this, that, and the other. But it wasn't enough, because to that man, I was a black man, and that wasn't enough. So you kind of file that away, and his ignorance, his loss, his pain, and that, that's a very, you know, I think, poignant example of how it comes out. But there might be people that always see that way. And I think society is a lot better than it was even 20 years ago. But I, I understand that. I understand it, and I, I don't know that I embrace it, but I move beyond it. So that's kind of my, my take on being black in America. It informs everything that I do. Just take one more. Yeah, sure, one more, and I'll make it a shorter answer. Apologize. One other question. Right there. What made you decide to join the Air Force and also thank you for serving us? Well, thank you very much for the kind words. Appreciate it. Thank you. So about that same time when I was 13 years old, I was telling a story about wearing the tie to school. I decided I really wanted to go to West Point. I'd seen a picture of a West Point cadet on some poster, and I said, I want to be a West Pointer. So I sat down, and I wrote a letter to my congressman, and I said, I'm Chris Howard. I'm a good student. I'm a good athlete. I'm a good leader, and you need to give me a congressional appointment to go to West Point, right, when I turned, you know, 70, 18 years old. He wrote me a letter back. He says, you sound like a neat kid, but uh, here's one problem. I'm not your congressman. 
I wrote it to the wrong person, but I'll forward it to him anyway. And that kind of started an odyssey where I said, the best thing I can do to honor those that came before me is by serving my country. And for four years, I thought it was going to be West Point. And then my senior year in high school, I came across this man, Fisher DeBerry, who I told you the story about. And I was recruited by Navy as well. And all three, the one that fit the best was the United States Air Force Academy. So um, go Falcons. And it has been a great journey. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have the best, best time. Cheers. Chris Howard. <clears throat> Thank you.